it's one thirty, and uh, one of the challenges for the chair of the last session is trying to keep things on time, especially if it's post lunch. You know, it's, it becomes difficult, and we do have our speaker, first speaker, uh, remote. That's what. Uh, yeah. We're going to ask the door and we get folks in. So, my name is Mustafa Nikhil. You too. I'm a professor again. of psychiatry, neurology, and biomedical engineering at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. I'm also a general professor of psychiatry and neurology here at Duke University. So, as how do you know? Interesting. The overall theme of our meeting today for leveraging existing data in a medical method for that disparities are very interesting and a very timely topic you might have to. Uh, timely in the sense that with the AI, with the advanced forms in AI, the tsunami of AI, we would have to adopt to how we incorporate, especially, and leverage these large data in our analysis. So it's an excellent theme. And I'd like to congratulate Igor, Dr. Durasani, uh, and the people who are behind the scenes. Lisa Love, how much I appreciate, and, and others who have worked to put this meeting together. The session, this session, is very much according to the theme, and it is perspective in health disparities research. It pretty much goes along. And to study a topic like this, you truly need huge, large data sets. So this session, I'm very happy to say, will have the National VA Health Data Set, our first speaker, the Data Dataset from our second speaker, and of course, NIA and NIH from our third speaker. If I might like to very, very briefly, I'm not going to take too much time. All the bio sketches are available to you. But be free mentioning about Dr. Piski Yafe, who is Scola Epstein Endowed Chair and Professor and Vice Chair of Psychiatry, Neurology and Epidemiology, the Director of the Center for Population Brain Health at UCSF in California. She will be talking to us about very interesting topic. What can the national VA health data teach us about health disparities? Christine? Hello, oh, everyone. Yes. I'm so sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, let me know, how's the volume, by the way? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, okay. Somebody come closer. A little come. bit closer to the mic would be good. We, we I, I can't good. get any closer because I'm on my computer, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk okay. a little louder. All right. So here, technically, Masood, and again, thanks to Masood, okay. that we have been able to adjust the volume. Fantastic. Okay. Anyway, I again, I'm, I, I had something last night, and being on the West Coast, I just couldn't be there in person. But I can tell you, I've so enjoyed listening as much as I could yesterday and today to the talks. And I there are probably 10 people I'd like to reach out to uh, to collaborate because you've all given me such such great ideas and um, and I've learned so much. Uh, and again, I'm so sorry I, I can't be there. I notice I'm I'm with two funding groups, which is funny. I, I wish I were a funder. I'm just a, a lowly researcher, but um, something that that I of years has been using the VA national data. And 
I'm happy to share with you some of our studies, or particularly around health disparities with for ADRD. But really, more importantly, I, I'd love to be able to, as I said, collaborate with many of you. And so I don't have a lot of slides. I'm going to go through the, some of our work related to health disparities um, and, and try and share with you why I'm so excited about the VA data and, and why maybe we could collaborate further. Oops. There we go. So quite a while ago, um, my my team got we got very interested in in some of the questions around health disparities. This was, gosh, now you know, uh, 10, 12 years ago. Kala Mehta, who was a, a I guess a junior faculty or postdoc at the time, we did some work with a study called Health ABC, and what we found was um, not unexpectedly big differences in the um, cognitive testing between the black and white participants. These were all non-demented participants in their 70s. And then we did a series of analyses where we were trying to understand what's driving what's driving these um, these associations. And what we found was when we we just did this was not anything fancy, just sort of basic covariate adjustment. But what we found was that when we went through demographics, psychosocial variables, health-related comorbidities, et cetera, we, we found that when we adjusted for socioeconomic status um, or, or when we put everything even together, we were able to just explain a lot of the differences. And this was really, I think, compelling to us because we felt you know, th this really, what, what's explaining some of these differences in cognitive testing really had to do with obviously not race, but 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 what, what people were coming to this with and the comorbidities and in particular, the socioeconomic status. So then we did another study um, in, in Health ABC where we actually looked at time to dementia. So this was a dementia as an outcome as opposed to cognitive testing. And what we found was sort of the same thing. Again, differences comparing black to white, um, as we expected, about a, a hazard ratio of 1.44 um, for a black adults compared to white adults. And as you can see that, and then again, we did this series of, of adjustments, um, including APOE in this case. And what we found once again was that a lot of this was driven by socioeconomic status. Now, social kind of status something actually should. We had uh, literacy, which was uh, as as um, Dr. Mint mentioned and others that that you know this is a better um, uh, assessment of quality of education. So again, when we adjusted for all these, what we found was that the differences between the black and white adults was really negligible when it came to dementia risk. So I think this was really you know exciting for us to try and dig into this, and it's sort of always been in the back of my mind. I'm not particularly known as a health disparities researcher, but uh, it, it really has informed a lot of, of what we've done. And I, and, I and I hope to now share with you some of what we've done in the VA. So the other thing that, that's um, I think is important to remember, and this is some beautiful work by, by my colleague, Roche Nianogo, who's at UCLA. We did a, a, some work recently where we were trying to look at modifiable risk factors. So we've been very interested in modifiable risk factors. Um, we actually were the first to show that 30 to 40% of, of dementia risk could be modified by these risk factors. And now the Lancet Commission has sort of um, replicated our work in terms of the PAR approach, et cetera. And this is work that, that Roche did where we, we um, looked at different race and ethnic groups in the US and you can see the, the uh, different groupings. And then we wanted to see what's the population attributable risk for these different risk factors. And you can see the different risk factors on, on the x-axis. And, and you can see that they actually vary quite a bit by race ethnic group. And this isn't something that people normally think about. But when we're when we're thinking about prevention trials or even 
risk factor um, stratification or prediction, we really need to understand, you know, that not everybody carries with them the same risk factor burden. Um, and I think we've seen that very nicely in some of the talks uh, so far. So what you can see is when when you look at this, the Asian particip the Asian um, participants in the study were, were had less of a of a predicted um, uh, population attributable risk about fifteen percent uh, when you combine all of these things, and they were notice noticeably different, particularly in education, um, physical activity, obesity, some of the things we'd expect. So this. This is sort of interesting to think about that, you know, we, we've heard some really great talks about environment um, and and socioeconomic status, but I think also we need to remember, and 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 Dr. Mint brought this up, that, that people have different uh, comorbidities, and this is true for psychiatric comorbidities too, which, which isn't really here other than depression. Okay, so let's turn to the VA, which is which is really what the, the main purpose of my talk is is. And that is why why might the veteran population be particularly uh, important to investigate? I don't think that the VA data has received nearly as much attention as it should have. And I'd be happy to to share with you all some of the challenges. Um, it's not easy necessarily to work with, although it's getting a little easier. And um, it's taken us a while to to form our cohort. So I'd be happy to sort of share some of our 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 um, experiences. But if you look at this graph, which is just a simple um, uh, graph by age group, you can see that as of 2021, about half the veterans are 65 years or older. So this is a really important group to be studying when you're talking about age-related outcomes such as ADRD. And we think that about half a million veterans actually have AD now. So this is not trivial. You know, if, if, if the U.S. has five to six million people with AD, about half a million are veterans. So we've been interested in this. Uh, we're also interested in this because veterans have the same risk factors that everybody else has, uh, but they also have some unique risk factors. So we know that there's a lot of psychiatric and medical comorbidities Veterans, we, we, we and others have found, have greater cardiovascular risk factors, and they're at an earlier age. Particularly, this is true for the Vietnam vets. There's also increased risk factors uh, because of, of military risk factors. What I mean by that, they're not unique to, to veterans, but they're increased in veterans. Things like TBI, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, in fact, the, the first study we did with the VA data was, um, gosh, 12, 15, 13 years ago, showing PTSD was linked to, to dementia. And that was the first time anybody had shown that association. Um, and that got us sort of interested in this question of these military risk factors, how they interact with regular risk factors that everybody has. And also now increasingly we're focused on social determinants of health. So all of these things I think are, are playing out in, in the veterans population. And we really need to understand as best as we can, who's at risk for developing ADRD and what we can do about it. So the other thing to note is that the veterans by and large are fairly diverse. Uh, and this diversity is increasing. You can see here that um, uh, black and Hispanic veterans are, are increasing. And this is primarily due to uh, younger Oops, my apologies. Uh, sorry, this is a Dr. Yampi, can you hear us from the room? Publish work, some of our ongoing work. Some of this, most much of this is not published, so please be respectful of that. Uh, uh, we're trying to understand what are the race and ethnic differences in developing ADRD in the veteran population? Are there regional disparities, which is sort of something that, that I think is wonderfully um, accommodated by, by the VA data? As Dr. Eisner mentioned, you know, the VA is really the only, the, the largest a, um, um, ACO, but not only is it the largest ACO, 
it, it is the whole country. So, and I don't think that this has really been um, optimized in, in the sense that we can really learn a lot what's happening in, in the whole country. And so I've gotten very interested in this. And then of course, we wanna try and understand what are the drivers of the disparities? Are the disparities explained by differences in health risk factors, social determinants of health, and some of the other things that, that I explained that the veterans are, are uniquely um, set up for. So over the past chunk of time, we've, um, we've put together a large cohort, if you will, um, of, of veteran data. And this is from the national VA data. Again, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about this. What we've done is we've, we've sort of had a, a random selection. So about every year we have a 5% random selection of veterans. And then for particular projects, we might pull everybody, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. We did some work that I'm, I'm not gonna show with female veterans where we actually pulled every female veteran in the US. Amazing. It was so much fun. We had about 400,000 female veterans and we were able to look at a lot of things and compare them to male veterans. Um, and so the, the other thing to note is the VA was using electronic medical records really early, starting in the late 90s. So we have over 20 years of data from 2020. We, we didn't start quite earlier because not everybody had enrolled in, in the healthcare data in the EHR. So we sort of started in 2020 when everybody had this, and now we've got 20, 22 years of data. Um, and just to, to remind you, the VA is the largest integrated healthcare system. Um, the other thing I like about studying the VA is that everybody has access to healthcare. Now you might argue that the healthcare quality might differ widely by veterans, um, where you are or whether you're affiliated with the university. And so each medical center and healthcare center might be quite different. And that's true. Uh, on the other hand, at least everybody has insurance. They have access to, to some healthcare. So I, I like it because at least it, it helps us in our country, in our crazy country of, of, of um, so much health dis access and uh, medical care differences, at least this is somewhat more of an even playing field. And I think it gives us the opportunity to look at real world information. So um, I'm gonna focus now on a couple studies. And again, as much of this is unpublished. So the first study, um, Dr. Eiser already uh, set me up for. Thank you very much. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> you never know, you know, what the uptick is of your studies. Um, we did a, a study a few years ago where we looked at about 2 million veterans. These are all unique veterans. And as I mentioned, um, this was from uh, 1999 to 2020, so over 20 years. The mean age of the participants. Oh, by the way, when we when we do these studies, by and large, we start we only include people who are fifty five or, or older, and that's because just the, of the of the prevalence um, and incidence of dementia. So we've done some work, particularly in TBI and others, using younger veterans. But when we're looking at the ADRD work we've done, it's really been primarily in the older veterans. So their mean age was about seventy. Uh, one of the benefits and limitations of the VA data is you, you're using IC co ICD codes. Um, similar to Medicare, obviously you're not going to pick up, um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, insensitive nature in using ICD codes. We all know that. On the other hand, if you have big numbers, um, you, you can probably do some interesting things regardless. In general, all-cause dementia is really the vast um, code, there's, there's not as much specific subtypes of dementia. So again, it depends, you know, if you're looking at some of these questions, you have to figure out the right question that ICD codes can allow. You're not going to be able to be doing deep phenotyping, of course. Um, those are sort of more complementary studies. But I think if you're looking at, at um, questions that lend themselves to ICD codes, and particularly all-cause dementia, it's really a, a, a treasure trove for, for, for great work. Uh, in general, we always adjust for, for age, of course, and in general, we do find great proportional hazard models because of the competing risk of mortality that's so important in this older group. Those are sort of uh, generalizations. 
Okay, so this was um, a study we published, um, gosh, I think almost exactly two years ago, um, led by Eric Kornbluff, the junior faculty in, in my group. And what we wanted to do was just really look at, at the, the five race ethnic groups in the VA. And as you can see, that was American Indian, um, Alaska Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, white veterans. And then we just really looked to see at the age-adjusted incidence and then the hazard ratio, um, uh, which is listed below. And what we found um, was that compared to white veterans, all of the race ethnic groups, the other race ethnic groups had higher rates or higher incidence. Um, and when we looked at the hazard ratios, this was particularly true for Hispanic and black veterans, less so for American Indian and Asians after we adjusted for, for a number of, of, of things. So sort of interesting. Um, uh, and I think uh, it, it um, reflects similar findings that the, some of the Kaiser uh, data has shown <clears throat> us, and HRS, uh, although they don't always have the five race ethnic groups. And so this was really exciting to us because of um, the diversity of the VA. And um, and we are able to do this. Some of the sample sizes, you know, get smaller, but but at least we were able to look in these five race ethnic groups and um, found some, I think, interesting results. So we now want to try and understand what are the drivers of, of some of these differences. And um, so we're in the middle of, of doing some work trying to understand, are, are these differences driven by demographics? Um, are there differences by comorbidities? I showed you the, the Niango uh, work. How about social determinants of health? Is it military risk factors, um, mental health outcomes, et cetera? So now we're, we're sort of digging into that, trying to explain what might be causing these differences, similar to some of that work I showed you earlier. This is some work that's in preparation where we actually um, are focusing on the three largest groups, Black, Hispanic, and white veterans. And that's because um, some of the, as I mentioned, um, uh, particularly with the um, Alaskan, with American Indian Alaskan Natives are, aren't as big of a, of, a, of a group. And what we're doing is we're doing a series of analysis. I, I actually learned quite a bit about the Oaxaca Blinder approach. And I actually am gonna take that back to our team because I think we could do a better job at this decomposition and trying to understand this. We just did simple um, uh, adjustments. We've done some mediation, formal mediation analyses, but this is just showing you kind of what we're trying to do. Um, first of all, we just adjust for age and sex, and that doesn't really seem to matter so much. And then we um, adjusted for a number of visits because there could be an ascertainment bias, which I think is important to remember that people who uh, maybe different race and ethnic groups go more often to, to the doctor or are seen more often. So that actually did explain some of the variance. And then when we adjusted for cardiovascular disease, social determinants of health and military risk factors, and then mental health, all in one model, we're ending up about 25 to 30, about a quarter to a third of the variance we think is explained by these factors. So Interestingly, it's not as much as in our earlier work where we were able to explain a lot of the differences. So I'm not sure why that is, why it is with veterans we're not able to explain as much. It may have to do somewhat with the, um, the variable, uh, um, you know, using ICD codes versus in the other study, we actually was, was um, uh, more questionnaire and, and um, interviewer rated um, uh, outcomes. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know, but it's something we're looking into. But in any event, we're able to explain a, a big chunk of the variance. We've also gotten very interested in geographic differences. So this is uh, I'm sorry, it's a little busy, but this is a map of the U.S. for those of you who uh, want a reminder. And um, these are the 10 CDC regions. So there's the CDC has 10 regions. We use that because we didn't want to use the visions because there, there are too many of them and not everybody knows what the visions are. It's just a, the VA uh, organization, really. Um, we didn't want to use states because that was sort of too many. So we thought the 10 CDC regions were sort of a good compromise. And you can see this is the gradient 
of the race ethnic differences um, that I that I mentioned before. And pretty much these gradients exist everywhere. Now the regions have different incidents, which, which we'll come back to, but we found this sort of similar gradient um, across the groups with higher black and Hispanic compared to whites in particular. And then we're now looking a little further at some of these regional disparities in that we're trying to understand this is now aggregating everybody together. So this is all the race ethnic groups together. And you can see that the, the highest, which is what we anticipated, the highest regional difference is, is in the stroke belt, which is with 14. And the lowest is in B, which is a, with about 11. And then everybody else is sort of in between. So it's sort of interesting. And we're trying to understand what's driving these regional differences. Now, we've heard some great talks this morning, um, my morning anyway, <laughs> morning, afternoon, about what could be driving some of this. Some of it could be rurality. Some of it could be environmental toxins, socioeconomic status. So we're trying to really look at this. Again, this is all in preparation, so um, bear with me. We still have a, uh, some work to do. But this is uh, the regions uh, you can see on the left, A to J, and then the number of events and the, and the um, person years calculated. Um, and then the hazard ratios are, are, are uh, spread out after we've adjusted for various things. So we're trying to say, well, maybe it's because they have different ages um, but that's not really um, uh, doing much. Is it it's sex and race? Is it education? We have education from the zip codes. Then we also have the RUCA scores. So we've added uh, RUCA, the RUCA scores. And then we're also um, looking at a number of comorbidities. Is it particularly with the stroke belt? We said, okay, well, maybe it's because they have much higher cardiovascular disease. And really when we when we look at all of this, we um, we don't really see much explanation, which is compared to B. So our reference group is B, which I mentioned but that's in the Northeast um, that had the lowest incidence. So when we look at all of this, we're not really seeing a big difference by adjusting for all these factors. If anything, um, some of the, the differences are getting bigger. So we're really intrigued by this and I'd love, I'd love um, some of your thoughts. I'd love to connect with some of you on maybe looking at some of the um, toxins, environmental toxins, pollution. I think there's a lot more we could do here. I, I love the um, you know, environmental justice index as well. So I think that the, I, I think we could do much more. Lastly, I want to show you um, we have done uh, uh, similar work linking up with the ADI. So the area deprivation index, which you all have heard a lot about, is sort of this great composite measure of, of um, social Sorry security. Sorry to interrupt, but Christine, you have two more minutes. Thank yes, I, I'm, I'm coming to the end. Um, <laughs> thank you. And so we, um, what you can see, which is really interesting, is the ADI in the VA is actually quite normally distributed. So we were pleased that there's really this big difference. And Christina Dintinka, just published recently, uh, looking in the VA data using these different um, uh, quintiles of ADI. And you can see that in the VA, there really was, a, a, um, uh, as predicted, an association with uh, more disadvantage, with uh, greater, um, greater uh, uh, risk of dementia. So we're very excited about this work. We um, as I said, we're in the middle of all of this. I'd, I'd love to work with you all, but I think the VA provides some, some great data in particular because of the diversity, because of the aging population, and because it's a national, it's a national um, a database. So we can really look at some of these regional differences, hook them up with the exposome, and um, I, ideally identify ways to reduce disparities and think about prevention. We actually have a new grant that um, we'll be starting this summer where we're actually gonna pull all of the American Indian Alaska Native veterans and really try and get into some of those exposures um, much more uh, in, in depth because that was um, not all of the, uh, the work I showed you was just a, a, a random sampling. So with that, I wanna thank you. And I think we have, I don't know, maybe one minute for questions. But I, I really look forward to working with you all, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Thank you, Kristen. Wow, and I think such an important talk that we may have two or three questions. 
Please, sir. Just real quick, did, did you consider uh, unique stressors, particularly um, perceptions of racial discrimination? I, I'm sorry, what? Particularly perceptions of racial discrimination. Uh, in yes. Um, you know, we don't have, so we're, we're limited to what's, you know, what's EHR, basically. So we are doing some work with perceived racial discrimination in some other uh, studies that I'm involved with, but in the VA data, that that um, unfortunately does not exist. Any other question? Either. So if uh, we consider uh, veteran, non-veteran disparities, which factor would you say to mostly contribute to this disparity? In the VA data? Yes, in the VA versus uh, non-VA, for example. Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we didn't, we, I, I think from, from our work trying to explain the differences, I think the biggest drivers were social determinants of health and uh, cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if I'm allowed to ask a question, Christian, so VA is a very different corner in general. I work both at VA and here in the general. In terms of uh, we see there's a lot more substance use comorbidities, TBI, you know, yep. all you mentioned in that respect, many of these people have PTSD, which has already been shown a relationship. So how does this VA population differs from real world general US population. Yep. So you you said it very beautifully. They they uh, um I think in general veterans it depends a little bit on the age of the veterans because so there are big big secular differences in terms of the ages. But in general, yes, there are more comorbidities, both psychiatric comorbidities and met, and um, medical comorbidities, in particular cardiovascular disease. And there are, uh, as I mentioned, some unique military risk factors exposures. They're, they're not, I shouldn't say unique. There, there are some military risk factors that are, are much greater, such as TBI and PTSD. So when we do these studies, we take all of those into account. We adjust for all of those things. But you're absolutely right. This, this is a different group than um, if you compared certainly to ADNI or, or you know, university-based, um, uh, you know, ADRC kind of work. I actually think it's, it's, it's an advantage in some ways because we can really learn a lot about some of these comorbidities. I think it's much more of, of a real world kind of setting than the uh, university-based clinics. I will Thank say it's, uh, it's primarily men, though, but that that is yes. one one issue, um, you know, which is why we did that study with women. But yes, it's it's uh, you know ninety five percent men. Thank you, Christopher.